Cahal Summers. And I'm Georgia Lynn. Your Chagas Sustainability Advisors. And you're welcome to the Chagas Environment Edge podcast, bringing you the latest information, science and opinion to improve farm sustainability. Did you know that some earthworms inherit lifelong built channels from their parents? Listen in to hear more about this in part two of our chat with Professor Olaf Schmidt from University College Dublin and discover whether their slurry application is actually a friend or foe of the earthworm. This is really interesting and, you know, in open days and at the plant championships, and I'm always asked, what's the impact of slurry on earthworms? There are a number of studies from, you know, around the world. We did some work. There also was a really interesting study from, you know, a long-term experiment in Northern Ireland. So in brief, right, slurry in the, in the long run is good and beneficial because you add nutrients and food to the earthworms, okay? Now, it is true that in the short term, some of the worms are expelled because of the liquid it infiltrates and something in the slurry irritates the worms. We think it's the ammonium. So it seems to depend how high the ammonium content is of your slurry. But this only is a short term effect. And I think at the end of the season, you will always have more worms than uh, without slurry. Now, having said this, there is a special circumstance. There is a small number of papers. If you have a high heavy metal content in your slurry, in particular in pig slurry, where they used to use, you know, mineral supplements that include copper, for example, this is very, very toxic to earthworms. So there were a few studies that showed that in the long run, of course, if you add that slurry with the copper and other heavy metals, that will reduce the earthworms. But I think it's not generally the case. So then the ammonium leads to the next question which method is best you know and and at the moment we have a new um study funded by the department of agriculture where we investigate this but hopefully we will we will find that if if you know if you treat your slurry so that it will have less ammonium which generally is good because it will reduce the volatile losses and so on as ammonia, then that will also expel fewer earthworms. But I don't have the answer yet, but hopefully in a few years uh, we can speak again and we will have the answer. Well, you had a very nervous advisor here for the last three minutes because depending on what you said, I'd have to go back to thousands of people to tell them a different answer. But exactly what you said, I think, Deirdre, that's what I said on the day as well. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah, Carl, I, absolutely. I think I often say it's um, if you put dung and, and reasonable amounts of slurry, it's, it's a little bit like earthworms or a little bit like steak to earthworms. To, it's, it's a feed source and carbon. Olaf, what exactly is the earthworm avoidance response tool? I was reading about it in some of your research. This is a very simple um, assay that, you know, is used for initial screening, you know, of pesticides, but also of some other things. So, for example, you know, sewage sludge, which is um, land spread and also the products you know which exist now such as biosolids and earthworms are actually very sensitive in knowing what is good for them and what isn't so in this example you asked me about you you know it's as simple as a you know lunch box you know or you know takeaway box and you have on one side clean soil and on the other side you mix in the you know the sewage or the biosolids or the pesticides you would like to test at various concentrations and then you introduce earthworms in the middle you put them in an incubator in the dark and after 24 hours you see where they have moved to and they really know what is good for them so when we 
did this work, they would always choose the site with the sewage sludge, but only at low concentration. And then as you have more, again, I think it's the it's the ammonium or heavy metals, you know, or something else in the sludge, they will, you know, avoid it. So it's a very nice and easy screening tool to estimate, you know, is the material, you know, safe for land spreading. So it has also been used for things like dredgings, you know, from harbors and from rivers, you know, where you have enormous volumes and you just need to know is it safe. And the earthworm is just a very nice indicator because you see what their behaviors, you know, the avoidance behavior. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Just going back, I suppose, to the farm again, and lots of our farmers that I've been going on to would, would be kind of almost bragging about the earthworm casts around the far farm, like like you said, a visual indicator. But for farmers that are wondering how to increase their populations, because there is a, a, a big, I suppose, understanding now that the functions that earthworms provide is massive to farmers. But how, how, how what can we do to increase our populations? What can a farmer do to increase their populations of earthworms? That's a very good point and um, I would you know of course not advocate that we actually farm for earthworms but as it happens all of the practices you know which will boost earthworms and increase the numbers will also boost you know general soil ecology soil biology and health and so on so for earthworms the main two things that they that will have an impact is the disturbance and the food okay so if they are not disturbed that's why in you know in woodlands in permanent pastures but also you know in lay systems they will do really well because they live in the soil they can do all the stuff they do you know they reproduce they feed they have all the niches they need. So there is a litter layer, there's a root mat, you know, there's the topsoil and so on. And these large earthworm species, you know, the anisic, which have these enormously large channels, they really live in the one channel and maintain it all their life. If you plow and if that channel is destroyed, they very rarely will reestablish. And in fact, there is a study that has suggested that these individual channels are so valuable for earthworms. There is a thing called ecological inheritance. So basically like an island, houses are very expensive. So they are, in, they are inherited. So the offspring that has hatched, you know, near their mom or dad um, channel, they will reuse this channel and chances are some of them are actually really old. So obviously if you plow, you know, you destroy this house and they, you know, will have to start again. So we know from a large meta study that we undertook of all the literature from all the world that reducing tillage will always increase earthworms. Okay. So it could be that you stop to turn will increase the, the earth populations also if you reduce the plowing depth okay and then if you go on to no tillage you will usually see more sperms except when there is you know soil compaction but you also need to feed them so you also need to give them food so that's why your straw your stubble harvest residue always has to go back onto the soil and the more food you give them the more earthworms you will have so they love, you know, farmyard manures, and they will also eat, you know, slurry and even biosolids and so on, unless they are toxic. And this is why in, in grass lay systems or permanent pastures, we have most earthworms because it's completely non-disturbed and there is a food supply all year round, you know, because you have leaf litter falling and you have, of course, decomposing roots. And if you graze, you also have the 
livestock dung, which earthworms absolutely love, and they will actually move there and they will eat it really, really fast, which again is an ecosystem function, you know, because it will reduce nutrient loss and parasite loads. And so. so they are the main things, you know, reduce disturbance and feed them. That's, you know, in a nutshell, the answer. And um, I, I, I done a, an earthworm count and experiments with, with Dr. Owen Fenton, Professor Owen Fenton, actually, one year, you would have worked with Owen over the years, I'm sure, because I, I think I've seen you on a few papers. But we compared a long-term tillage field in Oak Park against grassland fields. And you'd have to search hard in the tillage ground to find many earthworms compared to, to a long-term grassland. Yes, um, I suspect that they, they probably are the soils sort of in Carlo, you know, in Caldera and so on that are very low in soil organic matter that have been killed a long time and it will take some time. So if you reverse to, you know, reduced tillage or no-till, they will need some time. Now there are some exceptional situations which I have seen, for example, near a Thai, where you have, you know, very large fields and because of very intensive tillage over a long time, earthworms basically have been eradicated. And then the question is, how will they come back there? Okay, because they are not mobile animals. And we know from studies that if you you know look at this in the field they will only you know invade or colonize a small number of meters each year so in those situations where you have very large fields and the earthworms are um, absent there is a way of inoculating them there are some very easy methods so what we did for example you lift some, um, you know, soil blocks from, you know, a good field margin or a pasture field, and you just spread them out in your field, okay? Of course, in the active season. And the earthworms that are in these sorts and the eggs will be the new founders of the new population. So I can only speculate, um, Carl, that this is what you saw, you know, so you changed, you changed the tillage, it should be good, be good for worms, but if they've been eradicated, obviously, they need to be reintroduced, if it's a large field, because they are very slow in recolonizing themselves. Yeah, that, that field looks a bit hungry as well. Um, I, I know since we started home, since we started putting in uh, cover crops, and even as on a farm on Friday with multi-species swords and it seems to be alive above and below. Maybe it's the, the diversity of, of, of um, plant that's in the swords. Yes, absolutely. They, when I said, you know, they need nutrition and food, of course, they particular like inputs with much nitrogen. So with a low C to N ratio. And we know from many studies, they love legumes you see because they are um, residues and so on are very low in C to N ratios and they are soft and palatable you know so they will decompose fast so as soon as you include legumes for example you know in a sword you will also boost earthworms and we've seen this ourselves on the Lines long term platform, for example. Well, if, what is earthworm survival and recovery rate like after drought stress? Yeah, this I think will become more important, I think, in the future. So, the different species we talked about and the glossary groups have different survival strategies. Okay, so the smallest species they have to lay eggs which are inside a cocoon, which is a sort of a hard shell made from their slime. So it will survive drought, it will survive frost for a long time in the soil. So these small species will die, but they lay eggs beforehand. And then the next autumn or usually spring, 
they will hatch and the next generation will you know start the larger species you know the anisics that we spoke about they will just stay deep in their burrows until it's over and they will basically fast but they they actually stay active we don't know what would happen with them you know for their survival if it's an extremely long drought and then the endogeeks they do something very interesting and chances that you've seen this they stay a little bit deeper in the soil they will empty their guts and they excavate a little chamber that they sort of seal with their mucus and they make a knot. Have you seen these knots like an earthworm in a very, very tight knot? It looks very pink and they will just survive and hope it's over soon. You see, so it's often a ball, Olaf, isn't it? I've seen yeah, that lately. very yeah. tight, very yeah. tight. And they usually look, you know, pink because they have, you know, an empty gut. Now you do it, you do see them if you dig, let's say August, September, they will start to die off and we are not sure, you know, are, you know, have they evolved for sort of the normal summer here and what the impact will be on longer periods. Because if you see them, it actually looks a little bit desperate, you know, because there's nothing they can do. They are, you know, thin skinned, they have no, you know, you know, exoskeleton or something, and they just need to wait and hope that they will survive because we will, we know they will live, you know, for several years. So normally they survive and then they will reproduce again in the autumn and the eggs will hatch in the spring. So that's the answer for the survival of the drought. Olaf, I'd say we could safely say we could stay the day talking about earthworms because I'm after learning an awful lot today, but really, really thanks a million for joining us on the show. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Olaf. Thank you very much. I always love talk my earthworms so it was a pleasure that's it for this episode of the Chagas Environment Edge podcast thanks to Professor Olaf Schmidt from University College Dublin School of Agriculture and Food Science for joining us on the show don't forget to rate review and subscribe to the podcast you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify and for more information go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie I'm Cahal Summers and I'm Georgia Glenn join us next time for the Chagas Environment Edge podcast Signpost to Farm Sustainability.